We're in lesson 11. Lesson 11 <clears throat> in our workbook. Talking about the silence of God. And basically we have two choices on the silence of God. We can view that as being permissive and we have authority to do as we please or that the silence of God is restrictive, that we're restricted to what he says. And there's a big difference there. We talked about some of that on, quite a bit on Wednesday night. We're going to look at uh, several examples today. But those of you that were here Wednesday evening, <clears throat> if the uh, silence of the scriptures, the silence of God in the scriptures are permissive, let's say if it's permissive, what are some of the implications of that? Put your put you thinking cap on here a little bit. What are some implications of the silence of the scriptures? God chose not to say something specifically. What's, what is, uh, Abby? Uh, God doesn't say if wrong, that he can Okay, if, he, if God doesn't specifically say that it's wrong, then we have the authority to do that. That opens up Pandora's box, doesn't it? That's really good. I like that. Uh, anyone else? Well, what does that imply about God? Uh, I'm sorry? He's, he's what? Apathetic. Uh, I hadn't thought about that, but possibly that, that, that could be viewed that way. Now, that's actually a good point. The more I think about it. Johnny Ray? Yeah, low standards. Uh, low standards. For us, yeah, let's, let's put that comma or semicolon for us. <laughs> okay, Greg? That God really can't anticipate the future and how things might change, and so that actually it's ultimately come to it's not all powerful and all knowing. That's kind of the big one. These others are very good, actually. Uh, I'm coming, Peggy. Well, hang on one second. But it, it puts limitations on God that he did not have the wherewithal, the forethought, the, uh, the knowledge to foresee 2,000 years in our, what it might be now. And, and, and I don't know about you, I'm not going there. I sure don't want to go there. But that's certainly an implication, a major implication, Peggy. Right? Uh, Ken used to say God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, that God did not have enough foresight to see 2,000 years. And people uh, take that and run with that now. Well, you know, that due to our, uh, our societal norms and mores and all those types of things that, that uh, God uh, just, we have the authority through his uh, silence to do as we please, basically. When it comes to scripture, Austin, I'm coming to you. Austin said that, it, that if you take that to its logical conclusion, then it would actually devalue what he did say. I like that too. That wasn't on my list, but I like that. It does devalue what he, what he uh, James and then Gary. These are all good, by the way. The silence has what? Order. 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 order, order orderly silence. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Gary? Deuteronomy 29, 29 
says that, uh, basically paraphrasing that, uh, this, that God is God, his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts and our thoughts, and there are other, several others over in the Old Testament even. <clears throat> and he's revealed what he wants us to know. Um, if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, that's not in any of our notes, but I was, I was looking at this yesterday. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. Of course, Paul talking. And I was, uh, now these things, brethren, I have figured to have transferred uh, to myself and Apollos for your sakes. Now notice that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. God says, if I want you to know it, I'll write it down for you. And you do not have the authority to just do as you please because I didn't say specifically. We talked about the Bible certainly wouldn't be this big if everything was not a naughty book. You remember we talked about in 2 Samuel 7, verse 7, several, several of you weren't here, so we're going to go over just a few of these that David decided he was going to build God a house for him to, to live in, so to speak, a temple. And then when you go to 2 Samuel 7 and verse 7, what did, what did God say? No. He said, David, did. first of all, you're a sheep boy. He, he, he nails him just a little bit. I took you from following sheep. Before you get too, too, too much going here, make, make sure you understand had I wanted you to build me a house, I would have told you to build me a house. Did I tell you to do that? No. Then my silence says you're not going to build it. In the, the tabernacle, remember in Exodus 26 and verse 30, um, he told Moses, see that you build it according to the pattern. God says, I reveal the pattern to you, and you build it exactly like, like I, I told you. When he, when he told Noah to build the ark, he, remember the specifics? He said, I want you to build it out of gopher wood. Now, we don't know what gopher wood was, but they did. What if they had built it out of cedar? It would have sunk like a rock. He said to make rooms. What if it had been one hollow vessel? Wouldn't have floated. He said, I want you to um, uh, pitch it within and without. What if Noah didn't do that? Sinks. He says he was very specific on how he wanted uh, him to do it. He's very specific today. Now we're going to get into some of uh, today's lessons, but on, on how he wants us to do things. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and, verse, uh, 16 and 17 says that all scripture, all, it's not a limited all, it's all. All scripture um, is, is given to us for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteous, righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Complete or perfect. So if God gave us all we need to know, and if the scriptures make us complete, what does that imply about things that we can't read? Does it give us permission or does it restrict us? The answer is it restricts us. Now, let, let's look at some, some actual uh, details here. <clears throat> look at, on, we're on page 28, by the way, in the book, 28. What has God said about the Lord's Supper? And, you know, Matthew 26, where it was instituted, 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul recounts it, we, uh, Acts 20 and verse 7, we, we've, I'm sure hopefully you've read that and you know that already. What does God silence and eliminate regarding the Lord's Supper? He said, I want you to meet on the first day of the week in Acts 20 and verse 7 and partake of the Lord's Supper. What, what does that restrict us to? The first day of the week. He didn't have to say, now don't do this on Thursday night, which some religious bodies do. He specified the first day of the week. Without Acts 20 and verse 7, if you just look at um, Matthew 26 and the end of almost all of the Gospels, if there was no Acts 20 and verse 7 there, when can we take the Lord's Supper? He said, as often as you do this. Well, define often. 
God did. Acts 20 and verse 7, on the first day of the week. That defines, that's specific. He did not have to say, uh, now don't do it on the other days. First day of the week. He says that we were going to take the unleavened bread, which we'll do in a little while, and the fruit of the vine. He specified that. What did he not say? Pardon? Hamburgers and fries would have been good. What about an RC? Tony? Yeah, okay, well, in the South, everything's a Coke. You know, you say, give me a Coke, and they say, what count? I'll give me a Sprite. Uh, everything's a Coke in the South. You just have to be specific. Don? Lance. Yep, uh, fruit of the vine. No, you're right. You're you're right. Um, uh, Lance, I think I saw your hand. So regarding the manna, uh -huh. there was a cer certain time he collected it and prepared it for the Passover. There is a certain time he collected it. Where, as far as the preparation <clears throat> for the Lord's Supper, that's over. You can get it ready Saturday night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Is there a time? Did God specify a time on the first day of the week? A time. He didn't, did he? So he says, use your brains. I gave you a brain. If you want to do it at 10 o'clock at night, that's when you all meet. I'm good with that. 11 o'clock in the morning, that's fine. Make sure it's the first day of the week. That, that, that's how what he specified, and that, that, by definition, eliminates everything else, John. I know. Uh, Oh, that's right. Uh, but you could imagine even 1 Corinthians 11, how, how big that would be if he had to tell everything not to do. God's silence. He said, I want you to do this. That eliminates everything else. Don. The timing in 1 Corinthians is you wait for your brethren until you're all together. Until you're all together, okay. True. And they, weren't they abusing the Lord's Supper? They were. Some were going ahead of others. Some were making it into a common feast. What did the Lord say about uh, uh, eating in 1 Corinthians 11? He said it twice. It's so important. He said it twice. He said, if you're hungry, eat at home. Don't you have homes? Eat at home. It's not a social event. Uh, it's not, there's no fellowship halls where, where we do all of this. He said, if you're hungry, you eat at the house. And don't, don't desecrate my Lord's Supper. Or right, John, you've already got ones. I'll, okay, go ahead. I'll give you two today. Okay. Okay. Um, have you heard the argument? Well, we're not all taking it at the same time around the world. That's true. But they're taking it on their first day of the week, and we're taking it on our first day of the week. But it's still the first day of the week. Still, and we're all taking it together as a, as a local congregation, which is very very important. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, chapter, page 28. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. What does that eliminate? What does God's silence there strongly emphasize? He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. What does his silence um, not condone? 
infants. A lot of churches, a lot of places, a lot of denominations baptize little babies. Well, there's a problem. There's several problems with that. Number one, can they believe? No. Can they understand? No. Are, do, have they sinned? No. So why are you baptizing them again? God's silence says, if you believe and, you're, uh, you can, uh, and understand, you can be baptized. But the implication is, his silence is, don't be baptizing babies. There's no scripture for that. There is no scripture for that. What else? Even if you look at the etymology of some of the words, bapt baptizo means to immerse, I'm coming, to immerse, to, to, to um, well, basically immerse. We know what that means. What does that imply about? Sprinkling. Is that, is that a burial? Is that a baptism? According to, no, it's not. God didn't say, now, don't sprinkle, don't pour, don't uh, whatever. He said to baptize, his silence says everything else is not acceptable. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, eliminate the belief <clears throat> in only salvation. Say, say it one more time. It eliminates belief only salvation. It says believe okay. baptize. That's a good one. There are a lot of denominations that said, you know, accept Jesus into your heart, say the sinner's prayer, which is nowhere in the Bible. It's not there. Um, you got to be, you got to believe, not belief only. James uh, goes into that, doesn't he? Uh, not by faith only. Not by faith only. God's silence has its implications. Brian, did, no, I thought I saw, saw another hand over here. Anybody else on baptism? These are all, all good examples. What does God say about singing? Colossians 3.16, Ephesians 5.19, uh, 1 Corinthians 14.26. Uh, James uh, says that if you're happy, uh, sing hymns. Uh, we see singing, singing, singing. We talked about uh, some of that on Friday night, uh, Wednesday night, sorry. Singing, if you... Are, um, what does that eliminate? What, is, what does that restrict singing? He specified singing. What's the restriction? Everything else. Everything else. Humming, whistling, dancing, smoke and mirrors, drum sets. Organs, pianos, because they say, well, we're still singing. Yes, you are, but you're singing and playing. He said to sing, his silence restricts everything else. It doesn't give us permission. Mike? On the back side of that, I don't have a good, good singing voice, but I, I like listening. What are you doing with the command? Okay. Well, if he, if he said perfect pitch, about 90%, well, I don't know about you, but uh, I'd be one. They'd say, Mitch, please don't, please don't do that. Tom Bourne, please don't do that. <laughs> I had to get you, Homer. No. He said to sing, as in, and we have to sing. It's a command. It is. And we'll be singing perfectly in heaven. I'm going to be the best tenor singer ever. Once I get over there, uh, uh, Margie, uh, come right. I'm sorry? Choirs. Choirs. What, what is a choir? It certainly implies some art singing, and it's entertainment. Singing is not entertainment. God says you worship me through singing, and you all sing. A good one. It's not entertainment. We're not here to entertain ourselves. We're here to worship God. Well, it makes me feel good. Well, so does Diet Coke. Well, I just, this 
this whole conversation I think is good because coming off the heels of the aids mm -hmm. and additions conversation that we had, you know, you could make the same argument on the surface and say, well, God never said anything about songbooks or projection right. or anything like that. So it's not that we're saying that if God didn't say anything about it, we just can't do it. Period. End of story. Like mm. we have to, we have to be thoughtful about it and say, okay, well, is what we're, is what we would put in place or or use to aid us, is that actually negating what God said to do about something? Right. And obviously, there He's telling us to sing. So anything that would change the singing into something else is is something we stay away from. But if it's something that would aid us in doing that or facilitate us doing that in a more orderly way, well then that's a decision that we have to make at that point. So it, it, it's I think it's a good thing for us to have this conversation because it's not it's not to say that everything God didn't say is wrong and we should never do it because then we would almost never do anything. No, that's true, and as and the uh, we just had the AIDS versus the additions, and a lot of, most of us were here. I'm assuming that we we were on top of that, but I thank you for bringing that out because, you know, First Corinthians 14, verse 26 says, "All things are to be done decently, and in order." Decently and in order. If it's not decent and orderly, uh, he, God says, "I, I don't want I don't want to hear that nonsense." decently and in order. So there's a difference between an aid and an addition. If we have a piano here, God said to sing, if there's a piano here, we can afford one, we've talked about this. Not, we, can't, we would have a nice one up here if we wanted it. That's not the point. That you be singing and playing. Well, wait, I didn't see that. God said to sing. That eliminates playing. And then to, to Brian's, uh, some people have the pitch pipe. I don't know how to use one, wouldn't have a clue. But they blow on the thing and to give them the pitch and they lay it down. And they're singing. What are we doing once they, hmm, whatever that, what are they, we're still singing. Did that add anything? Did we add something? We're singing. What does a piano do? That's adding. You're singing and playing. Yep. But each of us sing. It's not entertainment. We may not be good at it. God said, do it anyway. He said, because I see in here. Good points. All excellent points. I, Tony, one more. That's your two now. No, they need to be scriptural songs, scripturally based, don't they? Yeah. They, they do. Uh, they do. Growing up in the South on Sunday mornings down in the hills of Tennessee, my grandpa loved to turn, switch on the radio. That's how he would say it. Switch on the radio. And they'd play those old-timey, and they were instrumental kinds of things. Give me that old-time religion. We all walking around the house, stomping our feet. Uh, we just didn't know any better. Um, scriptural songs, not so much, particularly with accompaniments and all that. that that's where your conscience got to come into play on some of that stuff. I, I wouldn't necessarily condemn it in your house if it's, but it's, you make it entertainment is what you do if it's got all the other accompaniments to it versus worship. So we won't get into all that, but I remember that as a kid very well. Uh, number four on page 28. Well, God has said about using the church treasury. Now here's where uh, a, lot of, a lot of churches of Christ will ha have split over the years over how to use the Lord's money. Because once, you remember in Acts chapter five when Ananias and Sapphira, what was their major problem? They had a couple of them at least, but one of them was uh, covetousness and lying. And Peter said, while that, you own that, you can do with it as you please. But once you gave it to me, once you gave it to God, that's no longer in your control. So there's a difference between the individual and the church. We talked about that a, a while back. Uh, what the individual can, can use his money for is up to him or her. 
Once it gets in the treasury, we see from Acts 5, that becomes uh, God's money, so to speak. Um, so how can we use it? How can we use it? Uh, give me some where God speaks. We know we're safe here. We know we're on safe ground here. Use his money for dot, dot, dot. Evangelism. Are we safe there? We're safe there, generally speaking. Um, what else? For the saints. For the saints. Are we safe to, get to, to, to use the Lord's treasure? We, we do it here. For the benevolent needs of the saints. How do we know that's okay? God specified it. He specified it. What about his silence in that area? Well, you can use the money for anything. Homeless, you can send it to an organization, and they'll take that money and, and take their cut out of it for, for their lifestyles. And then what's left, they'll send it down, down, on down the line. There, God is silent on that part. He said, this is what I want you to do by implication. This is what you cannot do. Now, here again, individuals. Individuals, we can spend our money the way we want. And God said, do good to all people. If you see people in need, you have the responsibility as an individual to help that person. The church, not so much. So we know that's true. What, what else, uh, Brian? No, no, go ahead. Second one here. Um, okay. You know, and, and to that point, I, something we may not talk about very often in terms of how we use our money congregationally is, you know, of course we don't give to organizations and things that would supersede what we're called to right. do, right? But we pay the <coughs> city of Phoenix to have our lights on. You know, we, we give from our treasury money to make sure that we are able to aid Function. in what we're doing here. So there's, you know, again, even in that, back to the pitch pipe versus the piano conversation, you know, we may not be giving to a, a homeless shelter or, a, or an orphan's home or whatever, but we do use our money that doesn't necessarily go to our membership directly. We, we use our money to, like, keep the lights on and, you know, make sure the building is is paid for and all those things. I mean, there's yeah. There's reasonable ways to, to aid us in doing what we're doing to help us fulfill the things that we make. Yeah, the idea of being an aid. You know, if you have a building, God said, I want you to meet. We can meet under a tree. In Africa, they, one place they meet under this huge tree. Is that scriptural, to meet under a tree? Sure is. Sure is. We can meet in our houses. We can meet in a rented building. We can do that. But we also have the authority to meet in a building. God said, I want you to meet. We have the ability to meet in a building. Well, part of the building, are we adding anything? Or are we aiding this operation of this building by paying our light bill and our air conditioning bill and our water bill? People say this. I heard it this week. Well, what's the difference in a water fountain and building a, a, an addition back here for the coffee and donuts and fellowship hall and all of the stuff there. Do you, anybody see the difference in that? One is an aid. One is an addition. As we go back to Sean again, there's a big difference there. There's a big difference there. Okay, a really good, really good, really good ideas, good thoughts. Now, on this uh, giving to the treasury, on 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 3, Greg just did a good job up there a minute ago. Uh, what are the, uh, what part of God's silence would come into play here in 1 Corinthians 16? Give from the heart. Give as we've been prospering. Give on the first day of the week. Why? Because you gathered anyway for the Lord's Supper and all of that. Uh, what does that uh, restrict then? <coughs> Fundraisers. Well, I like baked goods. <laughs> Wait a minute. I like baked goods. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with cookies. There's nothing wrong with car washes. There's nothing wrong with uh, a community-wide say. Nothing wrong with that. As individuals. God said... That's not how you're going to raise money for me. 
What are some of the implications of that? Have you ever seen it? Well, we had a bake sale. Well, what did it cost you? Well, it cost me anything. But I gave it to the Lord. Uh, gave it, no. No, it has to be a sacrifice individually by each of us, by giving on the first day of the week, as Greg said a little bit ago. Um, we have no authority. God's silence. Now, if you want to get permissive here, then you can do anything you want to. You could. But his, per, his silence is, is not permissive. Uh, Carol? you got a lot of questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Philippians 1.5, Philippians 1.5, is that what you said? For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Number one, I didn't write this. Sean did. Um, but, yeah, well, the application, I think, would be this. I can't speak for Sean, but a fellowship is a joint sharing, a common participation. So Paul is saying, I thank you. I'm thanking you for your giving, your fellowship, your joint participation with me in the gospel. Carol, I think that's what that means. I think it's the supporting of evangelists. Supporting of evangelists. Yep, supporting of, of an evangelist. In this case, Paul. I think it's what that means. Uh, Greg? I think just to expand on that, Paul talked about some churches he did not take money from, mm -hmm. but Philippians said once again to his needs. Yeah. Uh, and they did. And so that was another authorized use of funds. That's right. And we have another example. That's a good one. We have another example we have where we help a preacher in Africa, in the Philippines, Ohio, Upper Peninsula of Michigan, all those things. The examples in the New Testament, every one, if you find another one, let me know. It was not there. Money was always sent to the evangelist. It was never sent to some organization take their cut, and then distribute it to evangelists as they saw fit. You're getting a superstructure now of organization. God kept it. I saw this one time. Think of it. Growing up, in, in probably all over the country, you used to have a thing called picture windows. You know what a picture window is? You've got to be old to understand it. We had BB guns, and we had a tendency to accidentally ruin a few picture windows. And there's hide and skin still laying on the ground in Kentucky for doing that. They also had windows with little panes. If, if we shot, if somebody shot through, <laughs> through one of those panes, did it ruin the whole window? What did it ruin? That pain. God in his wisdom, infinite wisdom, said, I want local churches. If something goes bad with a local church in Alabama or wherever, does that affect the local church here? It does not. Now, we're sad about it and all that, but it doesn't affect that. We're one pain. We're not one big picture window that if one goes bad, we all go bad. Uh, no, okay. It, that's probably a lame example, but it's an example. Lisa? So the example in Corinthians 16 that you <clears throat> Ah, um, yeah. So that eliminates, well, I pay once a month from something like that. I pay quarterly, so I pay quarterly. Mm -hmm. And God's wisdom, he knows that we need that reminder that we continue to give to it all the time. And it's just a matter of money to do this every time. Okay. He said, give on the first day of the week. What does that eliminate? Monday? What if I'm paid every two weeks? Well, on the first day of the week, every two weeks, as you've been prospered, that's kind of the little parenthetical there, if you will. 
Now you can budget it like a lot of people do. They'll take that once, once a month payment and they'll give every single week, but it's always on Sunday, the first day of the week. Some people don't. They'll get paid every two weeks and they'll give this, this, the, on a Sunday, the second week. Um, I would struggle with that a little bit, but I, can I say, no, I can't say it's wrong. I can't. It's the first day of the week when you give. Uh, we're going to have to hurry, Mike. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, God said exactly what you were supposed to do based on what you had. This is what I want you to give. And now he says, there's not a limit. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you must give this. You better give from the heart of it. And you would probably say you could also to go in on the first day of the week. You should be thinking about what is that gift. I can break it, break that. He did. Uh, you sow sparingly. You're going to reap sparingly. Okay. That's just the way it goes. It's a law of sowing and reaping. You sow a cup, what do you get? You get a bushel. That's a, otherwise, why sow? Why would a farmer do that? If he's going to sow a cup and get a cup, I'll just leave it at the house. You sow a cup and reap a bushel. That's the law of sowing and reaping. You, you, you give to God how he works. I don't know how he works all that, but it does. It does work. Now, first, first Timothy 3, it talks about eldership, uh, shepherds, all of that. Uh, give me some things. It says uh, be, men should, should be the husband of one wife, men. What does that specify, husband of one wife? What does that eliminate by God's silence? He didn't say that you couldn't be a woman. No, he didn't. He said be a man and, and, and have a... Uh, have one wife. That, imp that eliminates everything else. Um, it says that you're married. These people knocking on your doors with the white shirts, they don't stay long at the house. So where's your wife? Well, I'm not married. Well, the Bible talks about elders having to be in the husband of one wife with, with the believing children. Well, you got your kids out in the car on your bicycle. Uh, it's, it's a big problem. They're taking that silence of God and making it apply to anything that they want. Um, so we talked about that, number six. Number seven. <clears throat> we, we touched on this as well, but we also got about three minutes. What has God said about local church benevolence? Acts 11, we talked about that earlier. Uh, Christians give according to their ability. Send relief to brethren. Send it to the elders for, dispose, for dispersal. They know, they know the local uh, church where they are better than we do. It's a collection for the saints. Sometimes we'll say up here, if you're visiting with us, we're not soliciting your money. That's true. Now, can you, you can give if you want to, but we're not soliciting your money. It's a collection for the saints. In 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 4, 4 uh, ministering to the saints, being of service to the saints. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 12, supplies the needs of the saints. So it's very specific. So what does God's silence say? This is not for the world. You take care of your own. Now as individuals, you better, you better use your money to help other people too. You better as you have opportunity, but mine is for my people. That's just what it says. Not everybody agrees with that, but that, that's what it says. Uh, we've got about a minute. Uh, uh, Greg. I think with the, the summation of this lesson, you think about it, is that the silence of God does speak to us. It does.
That's right. Honestly, I think it's a, I think it's a test. I think it's a test. God gives us this test. He says, I want to see where your hearts are. Are you going to listen to me and follow it, or are you going to chart your own path? In 1 Thessalonians 2, he, he, he described that really quickly. We just read that not long ago when he says that if you don't want to believe the truth, I'll let you do that. In fact, I'll even help you. I'll let you believe. A, I'll send you a strong delusion that you'll believe a lie and be lost. I'll let you do that. As we talked about early on, a few weeks back, there is a book. It's an old book, but it's a good book. It's called The Thunderous Silence of God. The Thunderous Silence of God. His silence screams at us, really, of what we need to be doing and what we uh, don't need to be doing. Thanks for all your good comments this morning. This is not easy stuff. I get it. It's not. Uh, I've known this for 50 years, and I study it, and I study it, and I study it, and I learn something every time. It's not the easiest stuff. This is not light and fluffy, but it's, but it's important to our faith. God said, walk by faith and not by what? Sight. sight. We're always walking by faith if we use this. When you get out where you're walking by sight, you'll have to answer for that at the end, not and you may be on shaky ground. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sean will be back on Wednesday.